everybody. How are you doing on this fine Thursday? I am doing quite well. We have a special guest here with us today, as promised, as advertised, Serge. And what we're going to do today is I'm just going to allow um, Serge the platform and also we're going to both right now. So hello, all of Serge's followers um, and subscribers watching from over there. This is my first time doing that. Serge had to teach me how to do it, um, but we got it figured out in 20 seconds or less, basically. So I have, I have confidence we can do anything. Um, anyway, and then after that, uh, I'm going to let Serge talk about his own experiences and his own, I don't know, I feel like the word journey is a little overplayed, but yeah, basically, I mean, really your whole life, right? You've been kind of dealing with this in some form. So um, yeah, I'm going to let Serge just kind of tell his own story, tell y'all some things that are need to know. And then we'll get into some questions. I know I personally do have some questions, but I did see some pretty good ones already in the live chat. If you are here in my live chat for sure, but you know, I won't speak to, I won't, I won't make any demands of your audience search. Um, but in mine, if y'all could put some questions in, that'd be really good. And um, yeah, I guess from here, I'll let Serge take it away. And thank you for being here today, Serge, and sharing our platforms here. Thank you, BJ. Thank you so much for that. Well, you guys, thank you so much for being here and um, for all your questions. We have been going through them and seeing them. And this journey is really just a journey of advocacy. Um, I was born and raised inside Scientology. Um, in the very late 70s, my parents had already signed a billion-year contract by the time I was born. And the first five years of my life, my very, you know, youngest years uh, were spent, those formative years in this uh, Mexican Scientology cadet org, which uh, people I don't think they realized that there were, you know, holding centers for children, not just here in the United States, but they were doing that also in Mexico. And, you know, there were very, very horrible, horrific um ways that they were taking care of kids because we were all just lumped them in a room with like an underage girl that was supposed to be our babysitter for all kinds. I mean, we're talking babies, like newborn babies, three months old, put them on the crib. The mom goes and works all day. And, you know, that's that was how we were being taken care of, basically. So at the age of five, um, my sister had um, just been born because we are like three years apart. So at the age of five, she must have been around two, I saw just a lot of abuse happening and being very um, separated from my parents because we barely ever saw them. We were always just like stuck inside those um, holding cells of this minor that was taking care of us. I ended up drinking uh, a bunch of paint thinner um, and I almost, uh, sh 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 and I was taken to the hospital and then, um, that's the thing that made my mother first, uh, be alarmed. I think it was like her first wake up call, like, oh, I'm nowhere to be found in my own child's life. So after this, um, dramatic incident at that hospital, my parents decided to blow Scientology. They were like, okay, we're going to leave. We're not going to tell them they were, they got declared suppressive people. And we went all the way up to the um, north of Mexico, escaping and running away from people. They were sending people after them, trying to get them back or whatever. But they were like, no, no, we're going to leave this. This is very toxic, whatever. So then Elwin Hubbard dies in 1986. And they rope my parents back into it, saying, oh, we're going to issue an amnesty because things were being done wrong back in the day when you got suppressive person declare so they basically forgave all the people that had been declared in an effort to you know bring people back into the thing and my parents signed back up for it and basically what ended up happening after that is that my father left to florida to go train as an auditor so i always grew up with the example of an auditor being my own father so my parents were very abusive even you know, outside of the centers because they took on the rhetoric. Like Scientology's rhetoric is 
done by a convicted felon and is extremist rhetoric that pitches very sadistic abuse to be done. It ritualizes it. It sanitizes it because, again, the, the, the predators are being told that they're helping. So this is like the perfect cover up for people that want to sadistically abuse a child. Like they just go, oh, this is help. And that's how all the common sense boundaries get blurred between adults and children. And um, after my father went to become an auditor or whatever, my mom kind of raised me and my two sisters as a single mom in Juarez, because at this time we had moved to Juarez. So my mom was sort of like the one that was working and my dad was just at the hotel in Florida doing courses and going up the bridge or whatever. And my mother was basically like paying for him to be doing that. So I had a separation from my father for a lot of years and I was just sort of with my mother and my sisters in Juarez. But then when I turned, um, I think 12 or something, um, I had just graduated seventh grade. So just my very first year of high school in Mexico, that's how it works. Seventh grade is high school. In that summer, after I graduated seventh grade, they said, oh, let's go to Florida. We're going to go to Disney World. You're going to love it. It's going to be so fun. My grandmother, because I'm third, third generation Scientologist, so my grandmother was already working at the Scientology Hotel. So, and I remember being given the magazines. You see the magazines and it's like this hotel and then they show you photos of the beach and a pool and you just go, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be an amazing vacation. So... Um, we left Mexico and we went to Florida and we went to Disney World. And, um, you know, I thought everything was great and wonderful. Um, but then I got put to do courses, Scientology courses during that summer. Um, like I got started, I think it was 11 or 12 when I started the courses there. And, um, you know, little by little got started to get roped in, um, you get taught this nomenclature, that you get taught these words that are basically just euphemisms to reshape reality because everything is basically clouded by these euphemisms that replace normal words, right? Like instead of saying, I love you a lot, you can just say, I have a lot of ARC for you. So... When you have those type of words being used euphemistically like that with children is extra, extra confusing, right? Because you can think of like a weird man on the street inside of a hotel tells you, I love you as a child that might be like weird. Like, why is he, why is he saying that? But if you know what the word ARC means as a child, you're like, oh, he's just telling me a Scientology word. So they can be very inappropriate with you using their own terminology. And as a child, you cannot smell that there's impropriety because you're just like, oh, that's how we talk. My mom says ARC. He says ARC. So there's this like familial sense to all the adults that are in that hotel. And all of a sudden you're in a hotel where you feel like everybody here has been highly vetted you have to be so special to be here. So you're supposed to let your guard down on everything to do with what you're participating in this culture, right? Because like cult is short for culture. So it's about sounding the alarm on cultures that make it their business to institute policies that institutionally systemically place kids at risk and that is what the advocacy of my plight is here as i speak about these things on youtube and i contextualize my personal experience with these people it's nothing i could have understood at the time when i was 12 like i said bj my grandmother was in this right so i my grandmother was a lovely lady she was just nice and smiling and whatever i could have never seen my grandmother like oh she's the one that groomed all the people with 
courses and certificates to keep doing these audits, to keep doing this technology that is, again, when you put it in the lens of kids, it is a complete and utter abomination. And, you know, it gets a lot of the Scientology stuff gets very clogged up in like, oh, but you know, freedom of religion, believe whatever. But again, I always go back to a convicted felon wrote on a piece of paper to violate the law. And then all of a sudden, everyone's saying, well, you know, we got religious freedom. So how easy is it to circumvent the platitude laws and constitution, including but not limited to, oh, we abolished slavery when I, as a 15-year-old, got ensnared in a contract to so-called be a volunteer that landed me in slavery in a country where I wasn't even from this country, right? Like, I didn't know anything about America. Like, I studied how Mexico is supposed to work in my civic classes or whatever. Like, I have no idea how this country works, but I'm just being told that I'm so lucky to be here and I'm so lucky to be considered, you know, the the literal motto for, for the Sea Org is called, many are called few are chosen. So That's the Sea Org motto? I have heard that outside of the Sea Org. Now I'm wondering if they just co-opted somebody else's saying that already existed or what. So everything is being done under this guise of we are so elitist, we are so superior, we're so morally untouchable, and it couldn't be more of a complete and utter delusion because they couldn't be more disgusting. They couldn't be more predatory as every last Scientology mother and father brought children to a hotel and donated their children to a hotel to be ensnared and abused and put in all manner of positions that no child ever had the ability to consent to be a part of. And that is the part that keeps being completely glossed over by all of the mainstream media that what we were saying, it's like they just sell us all these altered importance and altered importance for those that didn't catch our live yesterday. It's an actual word, you guys, that I learned investigating things for Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard says that when you want to derail an investigation, you flood everything with altered importances so you can hide what you really want to hide. And since the people on the outside are not familiar with what's going on, right? Like nobody in our audience that hasn't had eyeballs inside of the hotel knows what it is. Everyone's so confused. Like, well, what is Scientology? Is that a religion? We were told it's this, we were told it's that. You get told a lot of things, but you never get told that at the epicenter of this racketeering enterprise where I was trafficked, where so many minors were trafficked, again, the reason it worked for me, guys, is because there were a lot of children my age doing everything I was doing and nothing raised a red flag for us. It was like Jenna Miscavige was there. Laura FN was there. All these kids we were all there. We all grew up there and we all thought we were so special, right? Because that's what we kept being told all the time. Oh, you guys are the most special ones. No one else on the planet is going to save it. You're going to save a world. And... Again, it's like it's so pathetic that, you know, this level of horrific, exploitative practices endorsed by all Scientology parents, because that's always what kids, everybody wants to give the Scientology parents the benefit of the doubt. Oh, you didn't know. Oh, you had no idea. They knew. They had a clue. They read the rhetoric. They saw it. They said, my child should really be exposed to this. So this is not a case where our parents were like Larry Nassar, where they all thought we were going to go see a doctor and then the doctor turned out to be a perv. Here, the parents know that they're subjecting their children to including, but not limited to, false imprisonment. And when I say that is because the rules of audits, you guys, L. Ron Hubbard says that the person that is delivering the audit under no circumstances can allow the person being audited 
to leave the room on their own determinism, on their own volition. So when you are strapped to those cans holding them as a child, while it always gets video recorded, while everything you say, if, if you scream inside one of these sessions as a child, like screaming, yelling, everything, all of that is written down. PC yelling, PC screaming, PC not cooperated. That that you you get called this thing also, you become this PC. That's what I've also explained this audits as a role play, BJ, because it's like as much as they everybody goes, Oh, it's just like therapy. You know what? I've gone to therapy. And when I go to therapy, I don't get told I'm a PC. I'm I'm me when I'm with my therapist. I'm not this name that they gave us, right? And it's like, we were trained to be the PC. When you're the PC, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to let the auditor ask you anything, control you, cross any boundaries. You have no power. You're supposed to just submit fully. If you hate it, if you don't like it, if you're triggered, you cannot leave. So this is what we're sounding the alarm, those of us that were children subjected to these practices that, you know, in the flip side of this moment is that we understand that this is just straight up enhanced torture techniques that do cross all boundaries that are so-called set up by the law. You're not supposed to be locked against your will in this country. So why the hell was I locked against my will as a 12-year-old getting thousands and thousands of hours of these so-called sessions. I mean, we're talking thousands of hours being locked up in these rooms, you guys, being asked disgusting, unthinkable questions. Like, you know, I don't even want to say the questions I wanted to know about, but they're sick. They're sickening and they're video recording it. So when you go, oh, but they didn't know, the whole thing is to know. Look at your face, Misha. It's like... Because like sometimes, I don't know, you're, you're also just so articulate, but also I think it's like the combination of that with my just general imagination because you're like, I don't even want to get into the questions. And then I'm like, oh no. And then I just can imagine like right now, like young people being locked in rooms, asking these questions, like, oh God, it's like, it's disgusts me. And it also just horrifies, horrifies me. Yeah. Well, you know, horrifying. because again, it's like if you have any humanity programmed into you, it should horrify you that children are being exposed to this level of depravity all with a full straight face, right? The reason this has not come out is because no, none of the Scientology parents want to call themselves out on the facts on what actually merits attention from the general public. And it's all been this laundering of their image to really sell you and to really create this whole culture of like, let's talk about cults and aren't they so interesting and aren't they so this and aren't they so that. But you know what? We, the children that were exposed to this, don't find them interesting whatsoever because it turns out that all it was is child trafficking 101. You can see it in the laws that are written, the coercion, the fraud, the racketeering aspect of it all, the exposing us to these disgusting things, co-opting us, making us believe that we had the capacity to consent to be part of this culture, right? And it's, that's the thing that is, that's why my hashtag has been, kids cannot consent. Is that simple. Don't tell me it's a religion. I don't care. If I'm going to be locked up against my will, let, let that to my parents. If they're getting off on it, you know what? No comment. I don't care. I don't care what they like. I don't care what they think is a spiritual experience for themselves. The children are not having a shred of spiritual experience. We were being exploited. We were being tortured all under everyone's approval. Every parent agreed to this, you know? Everybody's trying to make, oh, David Miscavige is really the boogeyman. Well, who gave children to David Miscavige? Who? How did David Miscavige get a hold of underage kids? David didn't have any kids, so he didn't expose his kids to this. Hmm. But so... The source of this is the parents, right? And even law enforcement, they're so like, oh, well, you know, if your parent put you up to this, 
That is not a thing. Children get sent to motel rooms to be trafficked and exploited. They still face legal consequences of placing their child in harm's way. It's called child aggravated abuse. It's a very serious felony. And if the parents are involved, fully implicated, who gave my passport to these people inside of the hotel? I certainly didn't have it. I was 15. I didn't even understand why it was a big deal that they were having my passport, right? Like they took it away from me because they said, oh, this is a Val doc. Going back to the euphemisms, valuable document. They they changed the name of your passport to, oh, it's not your passport. It's, it's a valuable document. We put all Val docs together. They're all here in the safe. If you need it, just ask for permission. You know, we just wouldn't want it to get lost. I don't understand that they're, literally trafficking me with my parents' approval, sanctioned. They were the beneficiaries of the trafficking. They were making money on not having to have an underage child to pay for schooling, to pay for just the basics, right? And again, we're talking about under 18. We're not Yes, if you're 18 and you can be considered a legal adult and you can go make your own decisions, you can join the military, you can join wherever the hell you want to end up, that's fine. But we're talking about the, those tender years where everything they did to you, BJ, and this is why we advocate so fiercely, is everything that's being done to you in that age, it's seared through you. Like you might come out as an adult and look all put together that part of your childhood and existence is always searing. It's always, it's, it's always with you. Like you can't just turn it off. Like there's no off switch to, again, having to contend to, with the truth, with the facts, with what it is. It's like, oh, you know, it's like it, it does take a lot for a child to understand and process the betrayal blindness created by your parents that you thought were really going to save a world and part of something very important, the ones that actually trafficked you. And they did that with full knowledge of what the facts were. Like I said, it's not like they thought I was going to be taken care of really well. They knew what the Sea Org was. They knew what they were putting me up to. They knew when I was at 16 years old, put in this prison program called the RPF as a child, and I was being made to twin with a self-admitted PDF file. So in what world were my parents not implicated in full knowing everything and becoming and being lured by Scientology. Oh, we're going to help you with a visa. We're going to help you with this. You're going to be here in the United States. Oh yeah. Give us your child. Oh, this is going to be great. We're going to really save our world together. But you know what? I wasn't saving a world and I was put to do these interrogations. I was asking adults if they had committed any felonies for which they had not been arrested starting at age 12. So why is a child asking adults those sorts of questions? Why is that happening still today? Because that's the problem that we have, right? Is this year 2024 and nothing has changed since I left the hotel for children, you guys. Nothing, nothing. There's no more guardrails. Everything is intact the way L. Ron Hubbard said to do it because again, all his sycophants, all his groupies, all his, oh, L. Ron Hubbard really knows what in the hell he's talking about are leaving their critical thinking skills at the door before being approved to be part of this hotel. So imagine that you as an adult have to agree that you're going to leave all your critical thinking skills at the door outside of the hotel, and then you're just going to be part of the culture and agree with everything that gets pitched inside. You're not allowed to have a problem. You're not allowed to call out something. You're not allowed to rein anything back because if L. Ron Hubbard said it, and they want it done, then you can't say, oh my God, children are being involved in this. Children are thetans. Didn't you see Owen Hubbard said children are thetans? Didn't you see that thetan trumps a body? A body is nothing. A body is just, just for, for right now. This is a lie. You're a thetan, you're a spirit. And it's like, what type of degenerate sells a child telling them that they're an adult and to put them on the same playing field? And in what world was this done at an industrial size scale? All over the world. All over the world. They have places everywhere, right? And that's what they've used to make themselves, oh, but look, we couldn't be doing criminal things if we're all over the world. 
right? It's like that's the their prestige is to have these now these empty buildings. You know, again, they make a lot of money because they collect blackmail on people, right? They own their protégés and their sycophants. They own them. Those people owe everything to them going forward. Their children, their finances, their marital situations. It's all a data mining extraction operation to make pawns of all end users. Even if the end user says they're loving it and they're liking it and they're all about it, at the end of the day, that end user is compromised because all their data belongs to the people that are in, stuck in the hotel programming and scheming and using that data against them. Like, are adults abuse? Sure they are, you know? But again, going back to the point, it's like, but they're willing participants to it. They consented to that dynamic, power dynamic and balance. And the problem is that they've exposed their kids to it. They've never been called out. It's very hard for kids to even have the strength to call out their own parents because nobody wants to realize that this, this is what it is. Like all of our parents were child traffickers themselves. Like in what world was somebody not? How, how did it not apply to them? And even the ones that didn't have kids, BJ, they went and got serviced by kids. We were the ones that gave them the service. Like, Tom Cruise got serviced by children. John Travolta got serviced by children. Leah Remini got serviced by children. Everybody got serviced by children. Like there's not a person that didn't go inside the hotels. Once they were approved, they have unfeathered access to the stuff, right? Because they're trusted. And in fact, the fact that they see it and don't say anything, then they become part of that culture. And then they're de facto trusted because it's like, well, how many millions did you give to these people, Leah Remini, $2.5 million dollars? to child trafficking hotels, damn, I guess that's not good that you did that, is it? Because like even Jelaine Maxwell, she was procuring the girls, but she wasn't funding, giving $2.5 million back to Jeffrey, but all the Scientology celebrities, Laura Prepon, all of them, Elizabeth Moss, they give money to this nonprofit. It's called Scientology is a so-called nonprofit that has some sort of tie with the IRS, whatever deal they made with whoever in the IRS. But imagine that the IRS is implicated in subsidizing and giving tax incentives to adults that go answer the question, have you committed any felony for which you have not been arrested? And then all of a sudden they go, oh, hi, American Express. Yes, I'm about to charge a hundred grand on my Amex because I'm about to do a program. Well, what was the program? Well, the felony which they didn't get arrested for is confessing that yes, they've been, you know, abusing their underage daughter. So now we're gonna do a program. American Express is gonna give them the hundred grand. They're gonna get it off of their taxes. They're going to write off a hundred grand off of their taxes. People that get the services, you guys, are wealthy AF. You cannot afford to be part of this hotel culture if you don't have money. If you don't have money, you have to be working for them, right? Like me, I, I didn't have money. So I thought, okay, well, if I work for them, then I'll be able to do the bridge and do the courses. Mm -hmm. So it's no matter where you look at it, they're just, you know, complete and utter disgusting people it sounds like that to me i mean i really oh man i've just been thinking as you've been talking of all the different a lot of questions have crossed my mind and uh, first and foremost it's like obvious that it should just be illegal but then you think about what that actually means that requires a lot like that requires cops that are going to actually do something who aren't paid off that requires an enforcement provision in it being illegal that you can't just spend a, it's not just a fee or something. Cause then, you know, here we have all the money in the world. And then it's like, you know, even better than a law, it would be nice if parents, you know, caretakers or whatever could like way earlier on see some of this stuff for what it is. But then I'm reminded, and you you told us too earlier, that 
they can't see it for what it is, particularly because it is so obstructed. Like they make up new words for things. So I was thinking about it's such it's such a it's serendipitous that you would mention this because I was thinking earlier today or maybe it was last night about how they really just like ruin the word love in general. And then you brought up that exact word as an example, like P Diddy, like calling himself love. And it's like the love album and the love off the grid. And it's like, I feel the same way about the word God. Like people have kind of perverted that word and been like, God, this God, that. And it's like, none of those things is true. And now it's just like, who, like who even knows what that word is, but it's like, Oh man, I've just, I've thought about, I mean, I had some other follow-up questions, but just in like, that's my main takeaway is this just, as you think about one problem, right? Like the kids, the children being, it's not consent. Like first you have to confront all these questions. Like what, at what point is it, you know, you have to let people raise their kids and then no, that cannot be allowed in a civilized society. And it's like, to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't pretend to know where that line is, but it's got to be somewhere before trapping the kid in a room with an adult to grill them violently and aggressively about depraved things, including of a sexual nature. Like you, that's got to have the lines got to be drawn before that. I think, I mean, I would agree. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Well, and that's the thing too, right? What I realize at the end of the day, BJ, is that it abusing a child is a felony and it doesn't matter what you're purporting it is, right? Like Jody Hildebrand and Ruby Frankie were calling what they were doing to their kids a religious thing. They were hooking their kids up. Oh, I'm taking the devil out of this child. But that is the plight of all of these sadistic extremist parents, right? It's like, and that's why for me, it's like the only silver lining is this, is that I can now have the voice and make the points that I wish someone adult would have been making while I was locked up in that hotel room, right? Because again, this is a problem where it's all a matter of agreement. All of our parents agreed that we were fair game to be locked up in rooms. And then because all of these parents agreed that that's what it was going to be called, then all of a sudden you have these hotels where this is running rampant. And again, it's like, if you're locking a child and false imprisoning, that's already illegal, right? Like the, the, the police doesn't want to say it like that. Nobody wants to say it like that. And nobody could say it like that because they haven't been audited, right? Like, so I get it. Like the police cannot say, oh, that's what they do. Search is the one that's saying that. But you know what? Everything I say is backed up by receipts thanks to L. Ron Hubbard because everything we did inside of that hotel was as a result of L. Ron Hubbard policy. So this is a situation where everything, again, going back to it's done with impunity. This crime is a crime of impunity, just like P. Diddy, right? It's like, you, he can't say, well, I didn't know the children were, he was calling for them. He was video recording them. Like once you video record it, you can't tell us that you didn't know. You can't tell us that you had no idea. You, tell, you can't tell us that you didn't have a clue because you documented it. You, you rec there's, that's the intent of the crime of these people. It's like they get off on having that power and, that's what really is becoming so evident to me as we see all these trafficking and abuse of minors cases coming to the surface. We go, oh, so Jelaine and Jeffrey blackmail, Nickelodeon blackmail, you know, Trouble Teen Industry blackmail. As long as they got some blackmail, then everything is not illegal. Everything can remain under the status quo name that everybody agrees because we're supposed to be living in a very civilized society where no one is above the law, but yet it's all just a platitude. It doesn't have teeth because the laws that we have, as long as no one enforces them, as long as the predators get the message that, yes, look, we have these laws, but who's going to go and apply them? Oh, nobody. So you know what? You're good. You're good. And you know what? If you have a lot of expensive attorneys that have a lot of expensive ways of, you know, then it's going to be okay. You know, I mean, what type of levers of power had to be moved so that only Jelaine ended up blamed for everything? Like, and we know that that's not the only person. So, 
but we're so all supposed to be like, oh yeah, let's all move on. Justice was served. Next, next, next. And it's like, that's the problem with these systems, right? It's like, we got the P. Diddy's that are doing this. We got the Jelaine's and Jeffrey's doing this. And why are they all video recording atrocities? That's the other common denominator that makes no sense. Why are they doing that? What I mean, what do you think? Um, well, again, going back to what do they what does a trafficker need? They need blackmail. Right. Compromise. Once they compromise them, mm. they own them. My parents were owned, right? My parents, they're there. They're putting their money there. They're putting their money where their mouth is. That's that's the problem of like, oh no, nobody had a clue. No. These people did. They read the book. They read what it said. They drilled it. They groomed it. They did it themselves on a, as adults. And they thought, oh, you know who really could benefit from this? My underage child. That's the problem. That's the problem here. It's like, but it sounds like to me, it's not only are they putting up their child to benefit the child. It sounds like they're putting up the child to offer something up to the religion, like or the church or the whatever it is, the cult, the group, the culture, the whatever it is. It's like they they are putting their child up. I mean, in your case, you were auditing. I'm sure in some children's case, they were doing other manual labor type things. And it's like, that's labor. And what you were doing was also labor. And someone else, adult namely, were getting spiritual gratification or whatever out of it. I mean, I can't, I don't, who knows? But it's like not just putting your kid in a religion or a group or whatever to say, help the kid and make the kid better. Maybe they actually delusionally believe that. Like I think for maybe a couple moments in time, Ruby Frankie believed she was helping the kids. I don't think she always thought that. I think she was also a sadistic abuser and she deserves what she got. But in addition to helping the kids, they're also like, Certainly, there's certain certainly they don't believe they're helping their kids when their kids are like doing hard labor for 12 hours a day. And that's the contrary fact of the whole entire matter, right? Like you can't tell me I'm helping a kitten by submerging him underwater. Like it is it's just you, you know, it's like it's just like these people, that's what they've done though. That They've told us all these other things that they believe in their altered importances because all they use is the word God, is the word spirituality, is the word love to embellish what they actually are getting off on. Because if Ruby Frankie wasn't getting off on her own power trip. She was. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like then, then it all makes sense, right? But so, you know, and even I was horrified at the prosecutor that did that case because it's again it's all done with all these like kitty gloves it's like they get kid gloves oh ruby oh look she did learn her lesson oh look we've never had someone congratulate the entire government really you don't see what this woman is and was imagine we didn't see all the evidence that was on the case bj and again it's like when you see a predator it's like they're predators. Like there's no on off mode. It's like, and when you're doing it to kids, the most vulnerable, the most helpless, the most gullible, the most naive, it's, it's anti-human. It's anti-human. Yeah, it's almost like this is the type of people that these people are anyway. And whether it be, you know, whatever religious extremist path you want to take, it gives you a reason to kind of clear your own mind for lack of a better term uh kim had asked do you think that the um the reason behind that is true indoctrination do you think people get are truly indoctrinated or is it cognitive dissonance and then this is her follow-up she's like there probably has to be a bit of cognitive dissonance before the indoctrination can come around meaning there's got to already be a little bit of you're not seeing the, the child abuse for what it actually is before you ever get indoctrinated. And then once you're indoctrinated, you not only have this reason, but if you really buy in, you have a duty, you know, you're convicted to abuse the child, but it's almost like, yeah, you have to start out like not really understanding that that or not believing or denying or not acknowledging 
that that is child abuse on its face in the very beginning. Because if you know exactly what it is, it doesn't matter if somebody comes and calls it a LMNO QRS. It don't matter. You're not going to do that to your kid. So I don't know. Do you think that there is like a split in Scientology or there is like different groups or factions where some people truly genuinely are like sold out and they believe it? And maybe some people are just so compromised that they're just fooling themselves and they just go along with it because they don't want to lose their connections or is everybody kind of homogenous? What's your thoughts on that? Well, let's quote man of the hour convicted felon Elwin Hubbard, who said, the one thing man can't and won't confront is evil. The one thing man can't and won't confront is evil. Evil makes us very uneasy. Evil makes us, our mind immediately goes, well, it couldn't have been that bad. Or it, it makes us uncomfortable, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not comfortable to sit here and think a parent put their kids in harm's way for self-gratification, power tripping, delusional, not based in any reality, right? And it's like, but so how do we get there? It's like, because we're not confronting how evil people can be, right? It's like, yes. was there cognitive dissonance and indoctrination? Sure. Hitler did that with an entire nation, right? It's called extremist. When you're not the extreme of anything, You're already out of the bounds of the law. The law doesn't acknowledge extreme viewpoints. If you go to anything extreme, you're going to find it illegal in some law. Oh, this is no, you, no one is allowed to be extreme. Actually, the laws are there to rein them back in, right? It's like, no, 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 guys. Like these are the guidelines. You can do a lot, but you cannot go here. Yes, you have a lot of freedoms, but you cannot go there. So I feel like, yes, there's cognitive dissonance, but, you know, there's cognitive dissonance in every single criminal, right? Like Charles Manson's posse, all those women that did all those horrible things because Charles Manson told them it was a good idea. They were cognitive dissonant, but they still made a choice. There's still a a choice that that adult is making. Ruby made the choice to get handcuffs, to go on Amazon and go, oh, let me get some handcuffs. Let me order them. Let me put them on a child. And putting honey and cayenne pepper in their wounds. I mean, that's next. That's next, next. That's 17 next levels. Just honestly, the depravity to do that to anyone, much less a child, much less the one you brought into the world. I I just, uh, and I I have seen this before in the Free Britney movement. It was like at the very beginning of when I first got in it, we were being called conspiracy theorists. There are some people that have been, you know, pounding the pavement for years before I ever even heard about it. Mm -hmm. And people were like, you're crazy, you know, conspiracy theory, whatever, whatever. And people's reason for believing that on the surface, like what they would tell you would be her family's involved. Courts are involved. Cops have been involved. All kinds of doctors have been involved. I mean, there's just no way all these people are allowing this to happen. And most importantly, her family doesn't seem to have an issue with it. So y'all are crazy for thinking anything's actually amiss. But now it's like, you know, it wasn't just today I realized this. I realized this a while back. But this L. Ron Hubbard quote, you know, even a broken clock is right twice a day, as they say. Mm -hmm. And it brings that's exactly what was going on. Nobody would even confront it. Nobody would even consider Mm -hmm. her parents were abusing her. Mm -hmm. No one could even possibly consider and utter Like for them to believe that something untoward was going on, they would have to believe the necessary assumption under underlying the argument, which is her parents and namely her father, who was her conservator at the time, are in on it. They abused her and are actively gaining something from that abuse every day that Jamie Spears was living in his paid for house. Yeah. And, you know, they had to confront it because it just the evidence became too overwhelming. And that's kind of why I keep doing these movements and making these different videos, because it works. This is the only thing that works is getting the people to know, you know, the transparency, the um, getting the word out, basically. And then once the people see that it's abuse, then stuff usually gets done. I mean, 
No. And it's called advocacy, right? And that's the power that we have. We have the power to educate. If you're not educated, you cannot be a good advocate because you don't know what you're advocating for. You don't know what part of the issue you really should be standing on. And I think that, you know, you're so right about these movements. And that's why I think that I have so much hope that, you know, so many people sit with us on these lives, give us their time. This is an investment. Time goes away. Like they have a choice of not to, tuning us out completely and not caring about this issue. Like there's a million options that YouTube pushes on people all the time. And I'm always seeing how, you know, I never thought that people would want to help us like this. Like, you know, you we were always told the lie that nobody would believe us, that we're conspiratorial, that we're making trouble. We've been thinking that we're, you know, every time we come and say these things, there's like that part of our programming that short circuits that feels bad because we're making trouble for all these predators that are relying on our silence. Like, uh, you know, how many NDAs that I signed as a child, as an underage child? Who else makes children sign NDAs? P. Diddy. Who else children sign NDAs? Nickelodeon. So it's, it's part of this predatory trafficking, exploitative thing that it's done through humans. It is modern day slavery. It's not being done with the chains unless you Ruby Frankie and you thought that your $3.5 million house was never going to be suspected. So that's where it's happening like that, right? But these people that are more trying to mold in more into the society, they weren't putting children on handcuffs like this. Our handcuffs were like this, right? It was a can. Like we were holding mm -hmm. it like this. We couldn't move. We were being asked intrusive, disgusting questions and we couldn't move. And if we cried, if we said we don't like it, if we say I want to leave, things would get worse. The interrogation would get more intense. You would get locked up for longer, you know, and imagine. It BJ, feels look like it's so obvious that they were doing that to children specifically to break so-called break your spirit like like it's like when you break a horse like an animal like you take away its own will and you replace it with yours and like ruby frankie it's the same thing that was described with her too it was like if they even so much as said i am thirsty that was too much they were being disobedient they were being demons i, I mean it is it is ritual abuse and the upside down of it all is it's so dark and it's being called of god it's like and love, right? This is love. This is love. Making somebody hold cans and can't move, can't cry, can't leave. And they're not even old enough to consent to do that. Is child labor? That's love? No. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's get to some of these questions. One here for you, Serge. Why do they, why, why do they use weird words and language in Scientology, but just cults in general? Because it's very powerful, guys, because like, like you were saying, it's like, what's the framework of the cognitive dissonance? The cognitive dissonance happens by pitch. You get pitched something. Oh, look, you're going to get invited to the white party. P. Diddy is the man. You have no idea. He's amazing. He's wonderful. You're so special to be here, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you bought that pitch. And they used all these like celebrity icon, all these words that paint a picture for you in your head. And then you're lured, right? There's a seduction yeah. to the words. In Scientology, those words made us believe we were superior, right? If, if I and Lara can have a conversation in code, it makes us, you know, if you, you me, and, and, and my friend Jenna Miscavige are having a conversation, all of a sudden Jenna and I can have a conversation and you're like, what the hell did you just say? but we understand each other, it does give us an air of superiority, right? Because we know, you don't know, we know, you don't get it, we do. So it's that whole thing of that. So all of these people need those words to reframe everything because that's what actually embellishes and sanitizes and changes the perception over what's going on. You know, there's another quote from Alvin Hubbard that says, look, don't listen when you're doing an investigation. So let's all here do an investigation on Scientology. Let's all teleport ourselves to our Ron Hubbard way. Good. Okay. So we're out there. We don't want to, we don't want to be told what Scientology is. Let's go see. Okay. Let's go inside the building. Open the door. 
Who's in the reception? Oh, look, a 16-year-old. Do you have a passport? Oh no, they're holding me for they're holding it for me over there. Okay, thank you. Let's go deeper inside the building. A child is being brought into this room. Okay, let's sit here outside of this room. The child doesn't come out till six hours later. What was the child doing the whole time? He was sitting there holding cans. Like, that's what the problem is. Like, the looking of the facts, like, no, why are children ending up locked up in these hotel rooms and commercial buildings? It isn't in their best interest. I don't care that their parents think it is. Ruby Frankie thought it was in her best interest. And I mean, in fact, all her, uh, you know, all the um, leaked calls that came out after her conviction showed that she didn't care. Oh, I'm so misunderstood. I'm the one, like, nobody gets it. I'm the one that's being targeted. You know, so it's like, again, it's like, yes, you know, my parents would say about this conversation I'm having with you that they're the ones that are being victimized because I'm calling them out. Imagine that calling them out on their depravity is the wound for these sickos. Because again, it's like, you need to be told. And if no one has had the literal care in the world, because, you know, that's then we're going into tough love too. BJ, it's like, do I wish my family would have ended up all compromised in this disgusting racketeering child trafficking scheme? I wouldn't wish this on my literal worst enemies. That's why it's important to speak to the facts. That's why it's important to not beat around the bush, to just get to what it is, to get to the victims that need the advocacy now. Get everyone 21 and under is what I've been literally screaming. Like, yes, even 21 and under, I consider them still too vulnerable and susceptible to anything. If they cannot even pick up a drink at a bar, in what world are they being exposed to Scientology to trash their entire lives? But yeah, you know, we can start with first everyone 16 and under, then everyone 18 and under, then everyone 21 and under. But those are the victims here. The people that are consenting to this need to hire criminal attorneys and pay for advocacy for them. They can then go claim, oh, they, there was undue influence. Oh, they, they got lured into doing something criminal. Well, pay, pay for that advocacy because children that, you know, were abused because of your stupidity and your endorsement, because that's the other problem too, BJ. It's like even the people that were not inside the hotel personally abusing the kids are then giving them $10 million. Nancy Cartwright has donated, I think it's like 20 or $30 million. It's like... Her own child was in the Sea Org. So you see this pattern over and over and over again. And put your money where your mouth is. If you gave them $30 million and you had a front row seat access at a hotel, you're in a whole other category just on your donations alone. And, you know, thanks to the IRS, we will have full, full access to that information one of these days. Yeah. Let's move to the next question. Um, North Star Health Mentorship says, uh, are newcomers to the USA, quote, easier targets? Because, well, just in general, I think that's a question. But then they're also asking because maybe they might not fully understand what the freedoms are here. Because you you did say you don't really or didn't at the time understand really what how this place worked or whatever. You would just be told you were lucky to come. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a... That's actually a very good question. And yes, you don't know your rights. You barely even know the language, right? Like we were reading contracts and we didn't even understand the language. It was just sign here, sign there. And everything is always very hoo-ha. Everyone's so like happy and electrified and everything's going to be wonderful. We're saving our world. It's like, you know, it's like that's that's the part you don't see the darkness inside of the hotel because it's not like the hotel's like, you know, you open up and everything's dark and scary and moody, right? Everyone's like, yay, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. But that's the cognitive dissonance of like, mm -hmm. yeah, but we're doing this fucked up stuff here, but but we love it. We're all getting off on it, right? We're, we're all loving it here, right? Everyone's great with this, right? So that's what it's coming under. So yes, uh, foreign foreigners are much easier targets because again, the control of the language is such an important part of this crime. You always are in a power dynamic and balance when you control the language, when you control mm -hmm. the laws, when you control everything that there was to control, right? But 
We're thinking we're the ones with the power. I mean, when I signed up for this at 15 years old, I was being called sir by adults. Right. Oh, Mr. Wow. Gill. Mr. Gill. Like, they couldn't even call me by... I became sir. I became Mr. Gill. I became a child that was yelling and screaming at adults for not moving fast on their course. You didn't make your target today? You're so downstat. Like, what in the hell are you doing? You need to go to ethics. If you don't make your target tonight, you're going to be washing dishes. So make your target or else. Imagine yeah, me. Good character. It's making me itch. <laughs> Imagine me at 15 years old saying that with a straight face to an adult. I can. I can imagine it because I was in not that situation, but a uh, analogous situation when I started working at that law firm I told you about. Mm. Now, I didn't start law school till I was 26. Some people start at 22. Some people in my class start at 20. They turned 21 years though. They were so advanced, mm. you know, you know, these whiz, these brilliant brainiacs. So I was a little bit like, you know, the middle of the class in age, or maybe even slightly a little older. So by the time I graduated, by the time I started working and stuff, there were people who were two levels above me who were younger than me. Mm. So they would be my boss technically, and they would be talking to me all kind of ways. And I'm like, ma'am, you were born in 1992. You might have two more years at this law firm, but girl, you don't have any idea what I've been through in my life. Mm. You don't know who in the, you're trying to talk to like that because I certainly know it's not me. Mm. Like it was insane. And the only reason that they were talking to me like that was because we had bought into this culture mm. of the law firm, where if you are a third year, you get to bully the first year. And I didn't last long at that firm for different reasons. Um, I quit, but I can't imagine it because a lot of people in my class in my, you know, level the same year as me, they were like, Oh my God, I gotta, I gotta do this for so-and-so I gotta do this for so-and-so. And I'm like, that nerd, I ain't doing for him. If he wants it done tonight, he could do it. I'm going to watch Grey's Anatomy or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it just, and, and I do think, and it brings up something else you've been talking about lately, which is like the the pre-selection, mm -hmm. the pre-selection. Yeah, you are special. You were chosen specifically to do this thing because of some features and qualities. And that for me was my pre-selection. Like, I think it was obvious that I wasn't going to be able to do that. It was just some people just came. Now, I was 20, like nine years old or 28 years old or however old I was at the time. I wasn't a child. And that brings it back, you know, to these parents and it's true. There's really, it's, it's hard to hear it, but it's true. The parents are trafficking as well. Yes, they are. If they're given money and if they're giving their kids up to this, um, let me see. This is a question we have from Chi. Thank you for the question. Um, I think the question is, are Scientology parents allowed or able to see the list of terrible questions asked of children to gauge their receptiveness to being abused? So kind of a combination of what we were just talking about, like, can the parents, are they even aware of these questions you were asking people? Or was that your dad was auditor, you said, so he probably did know. Well, that's the thing. And, and in Scientology, everything is supposed to be done standardly. There's only one way to do it. It's according to what Elwin Hubbard said. And that's why it couldn't have been that, oh, these people did it so bad. And that's why you have a bad experience, Serge. Is the problem is everyone was under the same pattern. These questions were written by Elwin Hubbard. The parameters, the boundaries were set by a convicted felon. And that's. Do you think that there is, do you think that there are some people who genuinely are not completely traumatized by the auditing experience? And if there are, is something wrong with those people? Well, like I said, again, if you're not a child and you're a willing participant of something, there yeah. can be an infinite amount of reasons that you are not traumatized by that situation, right? Because you're comfortable with that boundary. And that's what I've now understood about how how it was so damaging to, to us as the kids because we were always made to feel we were adults anyways. And that's mm -hmm. the thing that our parents got you know, bought early on, they bought that pitch. Oh, my child's going to be an adult. They're on the same level as me. Okay, cool. And they went with it like 
to the nth degree. Like they were putting responsibilities on us that were not appropriate whatsoever. Hmm. But anything we ever said to push back, it was always seen like, you you don't want to do this. You don't want to do these chores. You don't want to do this stuff. So the parents know and the parents submit themselves to it. But the cognitive dissonance is this ridiculous idea by them saying that we were not kids and that's the part that splits it all apart really and that's another parallel with the eight passenger situation is that jody hillebrand lady has gone on camera and said it doesn't matter if the kid's two it doesn't matter if he's one if he's lying to you that's just distortion and it's like that was another thing they would do right they took that word distortion and put their own specific special meaning on it yeah um okay here's another question how much did it was scn does that mean science yeah how much do they charge adults to be audited by a child i think is what the question is yeah um so there's standard rates for everything and at the hotel where i was working in clearwater it pretty much started at 500 dollars an hour for the most basic low class auditor because everyone everything's classes like you could be higher trained and then it costs more than higher trained and it costs more right um but what's also so disgusting is that let's say that an adult wanted a special child to audit them so how it worked for your auditor is that you would pay for this auditing and then you would be randomly given somebody but if you wanted to specially select, let's say a child, and in this case, there was a girl named Natalie Galbiati, who was this gorgeous auditor, young girl that looked like a Kate Moss, like she was super thin and had this really soft voice. And all these men loved getting audited by her. So they would always end up paying 15% more. So imagine you're already paying like $500 an hour, we're now at 15% more, and then you get to choose. So there's a choosing option for these people too, which is what's so disgusting. That is nasty. You told me that before, but I think I'm a memory wiped myself. Um, okay, let's see the next question. This is a funny one. When the time comes, because it will, Serge, you must testify to Congress, will you? Um. Well, you know, nothing's off the table. I mean, anything that is going to make our advocacy be significant to to stop what they're doing to kids right now. So whatever it is that we need to take. I mean, if you ask me, Congress is complicit to a very large degree. They have all manner of people in Washington, lobbyists, people Charlie saying... Charlie Crist. Yeah. Charlie so, Crist loves them. Probably the DeSantis. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I just meant like, yeah. I mean, so if it came down to it, we would speak to them, um, you know, whatever it takes. You know, I know Paris Hilton did that and she was successful in getting some attention to the troubled teen industry. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we got to be willing to do pretty much a lot of things. Um, I figured that you would. And I think you would be a good person to go. Um, I mean, everyone is in unanimous agreement that you are very well spoken and, you know, you have this platform, so you have experience kind of a little bit live under pressure. I think that would be a good, I think you would be a great candidate for what it's worth, for what my opinion is worth. What is the best way to handle gang stalking? That's interesting question. Um, get. I don't have it here, but get one of those video recording cameras that you can just click on it. You know, because for stalking, all you have to prove is that they're doing it consistently in a pattern. So technology is your best defense because evidence is all what is going to come down to, you know, your word or your perception of the facts is not going to matter. You have to show physical evidence and video recordings are the golden ticket of receipts. So anything you can catch on video is going to be your best weapon against you know, corruption. And that's why my entire house is wired with cameras so that they can come and do something here without getting recorded and reported. 
I was followed one time in the store, like in the mall from store to store. And this guy was kind of like, obviously following me, like probably some type of private investigator, someone hired or something. And I turned my camera right on and I went right up to him and video recorded him and said, this is him. And then I walked away and uh, posted it on online. And I might post it again online right now. And I, I don't have never noticed anybody following me again since then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Next question here. Do you think since the Diddy and the Nickelodeon trafficking thing are all, is all coming to light that they will finally look into the Scientology trafficking? Presumably you're not supposed to be able to just pick and choose. And this is a huge organization. So what do you think? I mean, I think that's a very good point. You know, the law is supposed to apply equal to everyone. No one's supposed to be above it. So I have hope that, you know, all of these facts coming up to be inspected. And as we start changing the perception of what's going down with this problem, right? Because for how many decades has the mainstream media been Again, they laundered whose image? Jeffrey Epstein's, P. Diddy, Nickelodeon, Scientology. The mainstream media has always watered everything down and pitched this and pitched that. They always make money no matter what happens. Yeah. On your come up and on you go out. It's so true. they're the ones that are extremely complicit. And when you talk about all these outlets of Hollywood, who's selling us all these people? Who's selling us fake J-Lo, right? It's like... In what world was she a G-U-N mule? And then all of a sudden, this girl that, you know, everybody knows she doesn't have actual talent. Like, it's coming up. She's getting all these things done. It's like, everything is like trying so hard instead of being her. And I think that this TikTok, for whatever it's worth, I think has has changed the perception of things. Because no longer anybody cares if you come across in this big, overly produced stuff, right? Nobody Everybody sees through that so fast now. Like before it used to be that, you know, oh, J-Lo comes up with this thing and we're all supposed to be so impressed by it. But now when that stuff is being done by her putting $20 million to put out her own documentary all about how she's so amazing and great and love, right? And then you're like, wait, I don't think that you had any integrity because, you know, you could have had some integrity back in the day, but you chose not to have integrity. And then all of a sudden you have this multi-million dollar career we don't care about your success. We just care that you have no integrity because. Oh. <laughs> Got her. Um, okay. So this is the last question that I had starred. And then I do have to run. I'm a little bit late for my uh, late lunch slash dinner. And it's going to be very cold, but that's okay. We have this question. Why? Who is Mark Fisher? Why does Mark Fisher say he got so much out of auditing? Who's that? So Mark Fisher is this, this guy that is, uh, was a high ranking executive in Scientology and okay. he has a channel called peeling the onion. And he's one of these people that got in there as an adult. And again, you know, if an adult got off on that, there's photos of him with girls in Thailand that are disgusting. So I wouldn't put too much on him. Um, okay. because there's already like, I mean, it, it actually kind of proves our point. It's like so a man that goes and does that in Thailand would have gotten a lot out of auditing. That's what I would say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think the point that you make, it makes a lot of sense about, you know, it, it's it always has been the one thing that kind of just rings through everything else for me with Scientology discussions. And it's what you've said over and over again so many times, a trillion times. Children cannot consent. Kids cannot consent. They are not old enough. They are not old enough to consent, even legally. So whatever some weirdo likes to do, people have weird kinks. I don't know. They're allowed to do that. It's America. But children shouldn't be put in situations like this. And parents also should not put their children in those situations either yeah. um, if they can help it. And I do think a lot of the kind of never in people like me, I do kind of just... In the past, you know, before I met you guys and saw what y'all are doing and everything, I've kind of brushed over that. Like, you know, if it's bad for kids, you hear all these stories, you know, a mom will flip a car off of a 
child or a mom will fight a grizzly bear and win if it has to do with her child. So I think I just assume, just like the people assumed with Brittany's case, you know, the parents are probably not, you know, doing this stuff to the kids or maybe the kid, but it's like, no, no, yes, they are. They put their kids in there. Yes, yeah. they are. They are doing that. Uh, they, they, yes, they do have a choice unless they're literally telling me like I was handcuffed to the trailer, to the hole. I have a little sympathy for them. If they're in the hole the whole time, they cannot have access to their kids. Okay, fine. How are they literally supposed to get their kids out of there? Right. But I don't have the sense that that's most of these people. Right. No. No, it wasn't. So. So was there anything else that we didn't cover that you wanted to? Any like specific question or question groups that you wanted to hit or highlight? I um haven't been in the live chat. I like had a list of questions before we started taking them and it was like, those are the ones. But was there anything else that you wanted to touch on that you saw? No, I mean, I think it's all just baby steps. You know, we appreciate everyone that heard these things that had the capacity to confront evil with us today the thing that elvin hubbard was counting on nobody confronting we can confront you know and we can have these hard discussions and we should and again this is it's not a battle of this and that it's just a battle of awareness bringing up the awareness is what gets the predators to have to regroup and think about something else you know they're never going to stop figuring out ways to be predators and that's the problem but we will not allow them to have that darkness which is what they need to thrive yeah they so. need that cover mm -hmm. of darkness it's true yeah well i really appreciate you coming on today serge and Thank you're you. welcome anytime it's Cool. we did like a double joint thing and yeah. um yeah you're you're welcome back anytime and let us know too how we can help and support the movement that you're in or you know whatever else is going on um and and we'll i'm happy to do that and to boost and to signal boost and everything for what you guys are doing i think it's bad you know i thought i think it goes without saying but i will i do want to say it I think it's bad. I think it's unacceptable what you and y'all all had to go through as children, had to see, had to endure. I know you didn't ask for that. And it's it's a really heartbreaking thing. I do appreciate the survivor, you know, twist on it and that y'all are taking your just your narrative. Y'all took it right back. I, I see that. And they're having a hard time dealing with it over there in the dark. Yeah. Thank you, VJ. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So that's all that we had for today. In the meantime, facts ain't. Defamation. Love you, Mina. Okay, bye.